thank you. Um, I only have one slide, so for the most part, you'll just be looking at uh, the title. In his classic 1972 article on the national policy and the industrialization of the Maritimes, T.W. Acheson wrote that the Maritimes was not a region before Confederation, but rather a number of British communities clustered on the Atlantic fringe, each with its separate lines of communication and its several metropolises. Confederation and later the national policy economically integrated the Maritimes, consisting of the provinces of Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Prince Edward Island, into a transcontinental nation state, and in the process produced a sense of region based in many ways upon a shared experience of marginalization within the Dominion. My talk today sets out to examine this history through the example of Cape Breton coal, which became both an engine of national integration and economic development and the subject of regional interests. It is a story that demonstrates how region both shaped and was produced by Canada's emerging national economy during the 19th and 20th centuries. But while maritime entrepreneurs and politicians succeeded in negotiating a place for the region's coal trade in the emerging Canadian economy, ultimately the development of the Cape Breton coal industry during the late 19th and 20th centuries was shaped by economic forces and business practices that minimized the region's participation in national economic life, which was becoming ever more concentrated in central Canada. Through the cod fishery and the timber trade, the Maritimes had been long tied to a decidedly transnational Atlantic economy. During the 19th, and 20th, during the 19th century, coal would help facilitate a fundamental transformation of the region's political economy, away from the region's mythical era of wood, wind, and water, and towards the continental economy that emerged under Confederation. But the historical experience of the old staples trades would powerfully shape how the region's entrepreneurs responded to the economic possibilities associated with coal. Indeed, the, transform the transformative coal boom of the 1860s occurred not within the context of a national economy, but as part of an Atlantic economy in which maritime entrepreneurs had long participated. The centrality of Staples production in the economic life of the Maritimes was a function of its place within the British Empire, and the history of coal and empire were indeed deeply intertwined in Nova Scotia, during the 19th century. Industrial scale coal mining was introduced to Nova Scotia through a monopoly lease awarded to the Duke of York. In the 1820s, the Duke uh, was uh, conveyed this monopoly, which uh, from his brother, King George IV, uh, to his London creditors, who formed the General Mining Association to develop Nova Scotia's coal fields. At Sydney Mines, the association invested considerable capital towards the development of Cape Breton's Sydney Coalfield. When Nova Scotia's government finally succeeded in negotiating an end to the association's monopoly in 1858, the urban markets of the American Northeast were open to Nova Scotia coal under the Reciprocity Treaty of 1854. And the demand created by the American Civil War created a boom. Investment and employment in coal dramatically increased, and coal production from Cape Breton Sydney coal field rose fivefold between 1855 and 1865. By this latter date, three quarters of Cape Breton's coal output was destined for the American market. Leading Cape Breton merchants such as T.D. Archibald acquired coal leases and used their ships to transport coal to the American market. In important instances, local entrepreneurs found American partners and also drew upon Halifax connections and capital. An investment frenzy developed and speculation became common. Though in many respects coal was simply another export staple for regional merchants to trade, its production requ required a sizable investment of immovable capital. 
mine shafts and buildings, as well as transportation infrastructure, such as railways and wharves, to move coal from pitheads to the barks and schooners that would carry it away to places such as New York and Boston. When the United States government decided to abrogate the Reciprocity Treaty in, after the American Civil War and impose a $1.25 per ton duty on imported coal, even though the profitability of Cape Breton coal was dramatically undermined, coal operators with money invested in mining infrastructure could not easily exit the market. And indeed, the formation of the Glasgow and Cape Breton Railway Company in 1870 directed new capital to the Sydney coal field from Britain at a time when profits in the coal trade were elusive. The false hope that the American government was about to remove its coal tariff had facilitated this continued investment. But the deepening crisis of the 1870s would ultimately ruin the, Cape Breton, or ruin the Glasgow and Cape Breton Railway Company and numerous other coal ventures. Within this context, Confederation and eventually the implementation of the national policy provided a solution to the crisis of the coal trade, which had developed into a broader social crisis during the late 1870s as starvation threatened Cape Breton's recently created mining communities. Influential Cape Breton figures such interested in the coal trade, such as T.D. Archibald and John Borino, uh, became converts to Confederation precisely because of the abrogation of the Reciprocity Treaty with the United States. And Nova Scotia's coal interests, plainly represented in the Dominion government by Charles Tupper, succeeded in securing a duty on imported coal and coke of 50 cents per tonne in the 1870 budget, though it was reduced the following year. But while the prospective national economy envisioned by Tupper and others would offer a Canadian market for Nova Scotia coal to compensate for the loss of the American one, operators and promoters continued to hope that reciprocity might be restored. The transition towards a national political economy was halting and uncertain indeed. Eventually, as we know, conservative leader John A. Macdonald campaigned for tariff protection in the 1878 Dominion election under the banner of the national policy and won. As historian Ben Forster has demonstrated, the tariffs that were introduced the following year under the national policy represented a careful negotiation between various economic and regional interests. And manufacturing and coal interests were not one and the same, since Ontario manufacturers consumed anthracite coal from Ohio. But even though many manufacturers had opposed a coal tariff because it would elevate their input costs, central Canadian business magnates, such as uh, Bank of Montreal President George Stephen, eventually came to accept the coal tariff as part of a larger system of protection that would serve central Canadian industry but also, no, but also accommodate Nova Scotia's coal interests. Because of the distance of Canadian coal supplies located principally in Nova Scotia, Alberta, and British Columbia from the industrial heartland in Quebec and Ontario, the country's coal interests were deeply invested in their negotiated place in McDonald's national policy. The national policy had been shaped to accommodate coal because colliery owners and politicians from Cape Breton and mainland Nova Scotia had, during the course of the 1870s, lobbied for the Dominion government to act through bounties or tariff protection. The Coal Owners Association of Nova Scotia, for instance, advocated for an independent policy that would secure to us an outlet for our, for our products in the Dominion. And as pressure mounted, a parliamentary select committee on coal was formed in 1877, where colliery owners testified in favor of coal's place in a larger scheme of tariff protection. This pressure from the supply side, rooted in the economic and social investments made in Nova Scotia's coal fields, would play a major role in shaping the structure of the Canadian economy. Protected by a tariff on imported coal. Oh, sorry. 
Oh, I, I only have one slide and I messed it up. Um, <laughs> I'll just keep going. And protected by a tariff on imported coal under the national policy, the productive capacities built up on Cape Breton's Sydney coal field were reconstituted and redirected towards the St. Lawrence market, especially the industrial metropolis of Montreal. And that's why I brought this slide. By the end of the century, Cape Breton was supplying this market with nearly a million tons of coal per annum. And with the construction of a steel plant at Sydney around the turn of the century, Cape Breton was by the First World War not only supplying 44% of the country's coal production, but one third of its pig iron. This rapid expansion, however, also revealed a pattern of regional underdevelopment. Francis W. Gray, a Yorkshire mining engineer who immigrated to Cape Breton, was struck by the relative lack of spin-off industries associated with coal. He observed in, eight, in 1917, Nova Scotia has achieved the status of a mining camp, whereas its full stature should be that of a metropolis of industry. During the 19th century, the General Mining Association and later local and provincial merchants and politicians had developed Cape Breton's Sydney coal field by linking it to outside markets, first principally the urban markets of the American Northeast, and when that proved impossible, the St. Lawrence market. This accumulation strategy, rooted in the region's colonial business practices, produced a form of economic growth that later scholars often described in terms of the development of underdevelopment. By the late 19th century, outside control of the mines was rendered nearly complete with the consolidation of competing Cape Breton collieries under the Dominion Coal Company in 1893. And by the early 20th century, Cape Breton's coal and steel industries were more firmly under the control of Montreal and Toronto businessmen than, uh, than ever before. Though coal production generated royalties that accounted for a major portion of the Nova Scotia government's revenues, the profits from coal, as had been the case, uh, as had often been the case in the 19th century, were collected outside the region. Politicians such as Conservative Member of Parliament and later Senator William MacDonald of Glace Bay had advocated for the national policy in the 1870s and had succeeded in connecting the interests of the coal industry to the community in general. Yet, this cross-class alliance uh, that men such as MacDonald and reformist labor leaders such as Robert Drummond had forged during the 19th century would come undone during the 20th century with the rise of large uh, coal corporations and intensified class conflict. Corporate consolidation eventually produced the British Empire Steel Corporation, which effectively monopolized the Sydney coal field. Formed in 1921, this Montreal-based corporation pursue, pursued a program of stock watering and wage reductions that triggered what would become, that would come to be known as the labor wars of the 1920s. When the company's president, Roy Wolven, proposed an increased tariff on coal as a regional demand at a time when the maritime rights movement was at its height, the coal miners refused to support Wolven's regional claims. The leaders of the coal industry were not plausible representatives of maritime interests for many in the region. Unlike local businessmen in urban centers such as St. John, New Brunswick during the 1920s, who mounted potent business-led appeals to regional solidarity, the outside owners of Cape Breton's coal and steel industries had no such legitimacy. Thus, integration into the national economy had solved the crisis that emerged after the collapse of the coal boom of the 1860s, but had created new crises in the future as the Sydney coal field became a hinterland of Montreal's industrial empire. The national policy not only integrated different regions into a national economy, it also produced the context for the development 
of regional grievances based upon the uneven nature of economic development during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. In the decades after the Roel Sirwa Commission, the maritime provinces succeeded in achieving what historian Ernie Forbes described as a new constitutional accommodation seen in the federal government's efforts to address the social consequences of regional disparity. But since that time, the deindustrialization of the capitalist cores of North America and Europe have suggested that the problem of regional development within Canada is also a much more general occurrence of uneven development in the global history of capitalism. The national policy represented a 19th century effort by the state to intervene in the economy to manage and, and harness the vicissitudes of capitalism, an effort that was expanded to include a social mandate under what Vernon Folk described as the new national policy during the middle years of the 20th century. The history of Cape Breton coal and the national policy reveals the market as a politically constituted thing, subject to various forms of entrepreneurship and human agency. This historical perspective is relevant to understanding the economic conditions and business prospects of the maritime region today, though sadly it is often lacking. Thank you.